Okay, cool. I guess uh, we can start. Um, welcome. Thank you very much for joining my session. Uh, my name is Kabir, and um, today we'll be talking about Corpus One, which is uh, my company's flagship drone, which we've been working on for the past couple of years. And we'll um, take a look at some of the technology stack which we've been building, and also talk about some of the challenges we've seen while um, putting this out there in the wild. So I'll begin by um, giving you guys a little bit of a background on myself and the company. So um, I've been working on computer vision-based um, navigation systems for drones for quite a while now. And I started around 2013 when I was in high school. And that's also how I came across the PX4 project, um, which at the time was actually, um, which had just become an open source project starting from the Pixlox student team, which um, Lorenz had started. And at the time, I think um, PX4 was actually the only platform where people had even thought of applying computer vision to drones. So that's kind of where I went, and that's where my journey with PX4 began. So um, I've worked on a bunch of um, fundamental infrastructure um, in and around PX4 to enable vision-based navigation. And today, we also leverage some of that same fundamental infrastructure at Corvus to, to build our product. Um, I graduated from MIT earlier this year from the Department of Aeroastro. And at MIT is also where um, I started Corvus. And we, we actually built some of the very first Corvus hardware prototypes um, in my dorm room back in 2017. We went through Y Combinator in summer 2018, and we've been building the technology ever since. Um, earlier this year, we hit a bunch of critical internal um, milestones, um, which made us think that, OK, this thing is ready, and we should we should talk about it more, and that's why I'm here. Uh, we've been deploying this for about 1.5 years now, and there's a lot of interesting things we learned, and I'd love to share those with everyone here. Um, OK, so let's see. So when we were thinking about starting Corvus, um, we made a couple of observations about the market, um, both the UAV and drone market, which we were familiar with, and then also kind of the broader um, industrial automation space. So we noticed that um, this was back in 2016, 2017, something like that. Um, there were a ton of drone companies working on automated data collection. And then basically, um, a bunch of use cases wherever um, work at a height was necessary. So anything which people couldn't do um, and you needed a drone for, there was probably a company trying to do that already. But all of this was happening outdoors with GPS and in a very like relatively nice um, environment in terms of the technology necessary. Um, at the same time, we also noticed that there were a ton of companies in the broader industrial robotics, industrial automation space. But all of these companies were working on ground-based vehicles. And there weren't really any players in the aerial space uh, who were trying to automate some of the tasks which you can't do with a ground vehicle. So we asked ourselves, what if we could take the best of both worlds, so take our expertise in um, drone UAV technology, and then apply that to a certain sector of industrial automation use cases which required aerial data collection. And, and these use cases were just just there, and no one was touching them. And I, I believe a part of it is because the industry is relatively um, not very sexy in terms of, well, it's not self-driving cars. So there was this huge untapped potential there, um, which we decided to exploit. And then after that, um, after working on a couple of prototypes and thinking about the problem a little bit, we realized that to achieve true um, return on investment for a customer, we would need to be able to put a system in their facilities which wouldn't require any human supervision. And that's because if you have a person babysitting an autonomous system, 
why is it even an autonomous system? So that was the question uh, we wanted to um, answer. And then that is kind of the driving principle behind all of the engineering we do at Corpus. So we want to automate use cases completely, and we want to do it without humans in the loop. So um, to give you kind of an idea of um, our current techno uh, technology capabilities, I'll share a video um, through the platform, and then um, we'll take a deeper dive into the technology stack. So yeah, um, that's kind of a very quick demo of what we can do today. Um, the video was shot a couple of months ago, so our capabilities have evolved since then. But I think it's a good intro to kind of the pieces we'll be taking a deeper dive into. So let me switch back to the presentation. So um, next up, um, let's quickly talk about our vehicle platform and some of the hardware and software architecture which we've been um, developing internally. So when we started um, kind of ideating for the hardware, um, we, we tried a bunch of different things. We tried stuff like um, 2D LiDAR. We tried 3D LiDAR. We tried cameras. And eventually, um, vision came out on top, um, particularly because of the size, weight, and power constraints uh, we have to work with on a, on a really small um, flying platform. And the configuration we converged to eventually was um, this rig of six stereo pairs and multiple IMUs connected through the autopilot. And the cameras provide um, situational awareness in every direction. And they also stream a lot of data while we're flying, so we need to kind of build, we need to architect the entire system to deal with that kind of data flow. Um, in terms of the data coming from cameras, we realized that Wild Vision has many advantages, like it's very lightweight and it's also pretty small for what we get from it. Um, there's also certain intrinsic challenges um, which come from working with vision sensors, such as well, now you have a system which is dependent on lighting. Um, your lenses can get dirty. And there's a bunch of um, interesting calibration problems which we have to deal with, especially uh, when you're trying to scale this up um, into production. And we'll be talking about some of those uh, near the end of the talk. In terms of um, hardware and software architecture, we actually use a pretty much um, standard PX4 companion computer setup. 
So um, this should be familiar with uh, this should be familiar to anyone who's worked with PX4 and any kind of offboard use case. So we have a mission computer which is running all our high-level autonomy. It's an Intel um, x86 based platform. And this is talking to the flight controller, which is an STM32H7 embedded piece, um, which is running PX4, and a couple of extra modules from us, which enables um, tight integration with some of our autonomy features. And these two are connected over a UART, which is talking Mavlink. Um, we just, um, it, the UART is running at three megabits per second, which is kind of the top end of what we can do with the UART. And then um, we're talking Mavlink over this um, with a custom dialect, which is optimized for latency. Um, you'll hear me talking a lot about latency. And um, latency is probably the biggest thing we optimize for when we're working to develop high performance software um, on our side. So um, let's talk about kind of the main pieces necessary for true autonomy, um, especially on an aerial vehicle and indoors. Um, the first piece there is state estimation. So figuring out where we are and um, kind of enumerating some of the states of the vehicle um, using completely onboard sensors. So indoors, we don't have access to GPS signals. So the kind of standard way of navigating um, in PX4, which is GPS plus magnetometer, that, that doesn't really work. So we need to use our onboard sensors, in our case, cameras, to um, derive a state estimate for the vehicle and, and solve for some of these things. So our solution is an uh, in-house developed um, visual inertial um, simultaneous localization and mapping system. Um, what this means is we take um, camera images we detect some interesting features on them. These are typically um, features which are very distinct, and they can be tracked across uh, multiple frames. And then we use IMU data and some other information from the vehicle. Um, and we throw this all into an optimization problem. And in the end, we, get, um, we, we can solve for the vehicle trajectory and simultaneously the 3D locations of the landmarks. And by doing this and integrating our um, uh, position over time, we can get uh, kind of, we can recover the full vehicle trajectory, and then a couple of um, auxiliary things like IMU biases, which are necessary because um, we use consumer IMUs, um, which are on the autopilot, and these IMUs are, um, they have intrinsic um, offsets and scale factor errors, which we need to correct for. We can't just use the raw data. So our um, VIO VSLAM system um, actually uses all of the cameras on the vehicle. That is also one of the reasons we have a bunch of cameras pointing in multiple directions. Um, a common failure case for any system like this is when your camera cannot do feature tracking correctly. Um, this might be because either um, because you're looking at a blank wall. You're looking at waxed floors. We've seen it all. So that's why we have a bunch of cameras, which are hopefully, at least one of them is hopefully pointing at something which is trackable over time. And it is important to note at this point that we don't use any external infrastructure. So there's no, no kind of markers, beacons, um, anything of that kind, because we realized pretty early on that um, this is not, it's not feasible to do um, customer installations where we're going up and putting up all this external stuff. Um, and scaling that up just, just doesn't really work. So we use, we use all onboard perception for this. Next up, so once you know where you are, um, the next thing you want to do is you want to get from A to B. But to get from A to B, um, you need, you need some idea of what's around you so you can kind of navigate around those. And then also you need to deal with all sorts of unexpected things. So when you're operating in the real world, um, there's no guarantees about what will be around the vehicle while it's flying. So one of the things we tried very early was we just had this fixed prior map, which we would like go to a facility, kind of map it out, and then upload that to the vehicle, and then just rely on that um, to be correct over time. 
But it turns out that this is not really true. Um, if we are working in, in facilities where there are people, there's machines, um, all sorts of interesting things, boxes sticking out. So we kind of need um, very good onboard perception to be able to do collision avoidance and then um, additionally like do smart motion planning. So um, as I mentioned earlier, we use stereo cameras. So we have kind of a, we have a, a way of generating 3D points around the vehicle. And we do this, and we build a dense map around the vehicle as it's flying um, on board using the state estimate combined with the camera data. We run multiple um, very low latency perception um, neural networks. And these consume the raw camera data and produce uh, a volumetric map, which also has semantic annotations. And what I mean by semantic annotations is the downstream motion planning system actually needs to know about what it's looking at. So for example, um, you would deal with a human walking under the drone in a different way than you would deal with, say, a, a static box. So the motion planning system downstream is actually aware of these semantic differences and we, um, our DNNs allow us to classify kind of all of these different agent types, and we can make smarter decisions about them. And all of this is happening on board while flying, all using onboard compute. There's no kind of um, external link to a base station or anything of that kind. So next up, um, so. You know where you are, you know what the world looks around you, and then you want to get from A to B. Um, the way we do this is by having um, another large optimization problem, which is, uh, I guess, it's a pretty recurring theme in robotics. Um, we have a trajectory optimizer, and then we have kind of a high-level routing engine, which is giving goals to the trajectory, uh, trajectory solver. And we combine um, knowledge we have of the environment from beforehand, so whatever um, prior knowledge we have, um, we take that and then we combine it with the, the dense volumetric map which we're computing online. And then we combine these two and then use that to calculate uh, plants within the, within the world. So again, um, this is another um, optimization problem, and we're optimizing for a bunch of objectives like the vehicle state, the smoothness of the trajectory. Like you don't want to be flying really acrobatic, fast trajectories um, indoors inside a warehouse, for example. So that's another um, constraint in the problem. Um, we take into account distance from obstacles. So we always want to maximize safety whenever we're flying. We don't want to fly very close to anything. Um, and also, additionally, um, since we're completely reliant on onboard um, Odometry for flying. Um, we also need to take into account what the quality of that odometry looks like um, depending on how we are flying a plan. So, in that case, we also need to take into account um, the feature tracking quality over time as we fly the trajectory. So, that's another constraint in our problem to make sure that all of the features are within um, a kind of a good depth range for tracking. And then the last component is information gain, which is very payload specific. It depends on what payload we're carrying, and we kind of can optimize for um, data collection in that case. These motion plans are generated at 100 hertz, which is, um, I believe, is goes well beyond the current state of the art in motion planning for aerial vehicles. Um, we we generate and track these plans at 100 hertz, um, and we're, we kind of have a split control architecture where there's a trajectory controller running in Linux user space um, as a part of the Corvus Autonomy Engine. But there's also the kind of more latency sensitive um, pieces like the rate controller and the attitude controller, which is running on the autopilot where PX4 um, essentially acts as a linearized feedback controller. So we, we have the split control architecture where we can take advantage of the um, good latency qualities of the RTOS PX4 is running on, while also being able to do kind of the more heavy computation um, off board on the, on the mission computer. So now, once we have um, this, 
once we once we can get from A to B, we actually have quite a capable platform which can which can do indoor flight. But this is actually only half of the problem. Because you still need someone to tell it where to go, or you need someone to pilot it, even though it's mostly flying itself. Now, that is not that doesn't actually solve any of the problems we want to solve, because we're trying to automate tasks which are very boring, very repetitive, and we want to do this without anyone having to babysit the vehicle. And the key, the key to unlocking real value there is um, being able to do persistent autonomous operation without anyone, anyone touching the vehicle. And this, of course, requires complete automation of the vehicle life cycle. So um, as we're flying, as we're coming back, um, landing and docking, recharging the batteries, um, vehicles are very uh, power hungry. Um, and then processing the data we collected during the flight. All of this needs to be automated, and all of this needs to happen in such a way that no one needs to think about it. So the last piece there is actually um, our uh, dock, which is the Corvus Nest. Um, the Nest allows us to um, come back home, land, dock, and then it recharges the batteries, um, offloads data, and then we can, we're ready to go again. So this is the piece, the last piece of unlocking truly full cycle operation. And um, I think this is also one of my favorite pieces of the whole system, even though there are a lot of more other complicated pieces. It's really nice to see the drone um, taking off and coming home and landing very precisely, um, like over thousands of flights. Um, it's, it's quite beautiful to see. Um, the dock also acts as a gateway to other on-premises um, client systems. So if we need to offload data to people, um, we do it through the dock. And then in certain configurations, we also um, use it for edge compute and temporary storage. And the docks also uh, connect vehicles to wider Corvus infrastructure. So um, the docks are internet connected, typically. And we can push over the air updates to vehicles um, very, very easily. And uh, that, that makes the iteration cycles, whenever we're kind of debugging anything or trying to deliver a new feature quickly, it makes it very easy. So um, at this point, we have a fully functional, um, persistent, autonomous uh, drone system. But um, we still haven't talked about safety. Now, I, I know a lot of people, uh, when I talk to them about the system, they're very worried that there's this huge drone flying in a facility with people around. So the first thing we try to do is we tell our customers, um, try to schedule it for times when there's no one around. So like third shift, um, night, when facility is dark. Um, and this is like the normal operation mode we use. but as with any real world deployments, um, people don't always listen or they can't. And in, in these cases, um, we do need to operate around people and with people walking um, underneath as the drone is flying overhead. And to, 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 to do this, um, there needs to be like a fundamental focus on safety as we're building the system from ground up. It's not something we can just tack on at the end. And PX4 lets us do this. So PX4 um, runs an entire redundant set of estimators and controllers, which we can fall back to in case we there's like a catastrophic failure and we lose the entire mission computer, for example. Um, we can still um, land safely and not, not damage anything in that process. Um, we have a bunch of safety systems on both sides, so both on the mission computer side and on the autopilot side. Um, depending on the severity of the failure and where it occurred, we actually can either land the vehicle onto a safe, flat spot, which we've located beforehand, or we can have it come back home if it's still capable of doing so. And coming back home is actually one of the very important pieces, and it's one of the important metrics we track because um, if the vehicle makes it back home, even if there was some in-flight anomaly, um, we can um, debug it once it's back on the landing pad, and we don't need to actually send someone out to um, kind of redock the vehicle. So that's, um, we always try to come back home when bad things happen, but if we can't, we, we land in place with, with some um, safety there. 
We track a bunch of metrics, um, as you can see. Um, there's many, many more which we've been adding over time as we discover kind of the edge cases where the system can fail. And it actually provides quite a good amount of um, safety coverage for the entire system. Like, I don't think we've had any reported um, catastrophic failures in production probably for over the last thousands of hours of flight. So that's all I have um, for the technology part. Um, we can talk a little bit about um, what's next for us in terms of the company, in terms of the technology. So we're scaling up our product. We're trying to build more of these. We're trying to get it out to customers who really, who really want to use it. Um, in terms of the um, PX4 side of things, um, currently, we're in the process of moving from v1.11 to v1.12. Um, but since it's such a safety critical part of our system, this is taking some time. And we're working on it um, with a lot of oversight, just because it's such a critical piece. In terms of the mission computer, um, the autonomy stack is, of course, evolving every day. Um, right now, we use ROS1 on the mission computer. But we're looking into alternatives because of a lot of deficiencies we've identified with the middleware, um, especially when working with um, latency-sensitive systems like a drone. Um, maybe the future looks like ROS2. Maybe it's in-house middleware, which we develop. Um, I don't know what the answer is there. But I'll be talking a lot about um, the kind of middleware questions and infrastructure questions at, um, at my ROSCon talk. Um, later this year. So if you're interested in that, you should sign up. Um, let's see what else. I think that's it um, in terms of stuff I had to say. I would love to take questions and um, answer anything you guys might have for me. Thank you. Okay, let me see. I'll have a look at the Q&A tab. OK, let us see. Um, what the x86 mission computer is, are you running anything on the GPU in order to get 100 hertz? Um, the x86 mission computer is an Intel um, i7. It's a quad core um, i7 embedded class. So it's not like particularly amazing, but it's pretty good. Um, we do offload computation to the GPU in order to get kind of those very low latency um, things we need. Um, what is the max distance to the walled shelves that you can still operate with? Um, this is so we can we we maintain this kind of a safety bubble around the vehicle, which is about uh, a 0.6 meter sphere. So yeah, that is that is the distance uh, the safest distance we want to get uh, to uh, walls and shelves. Are all your ROS1 processes nodelets in one process? Um, it is a mix. So there's like one would expect that in an ideal world, everything could be a, um, separate ROS nodes and they would just be talking over uh, the ROS bus. But um, that doesn't really work because of latency, ROS ads, and a bunch of other like determinism issues. So we do use um, consolidated processes for a bunch of things. So like, for example, the entire vision pipeline is one process instead of a bunch of nodes. What is the flight time on full charge? We get about 15 to 20 minutes, depending on um, the temperature. And then, yeah. Uh, is the charging wireless? No, the charging is contact-based. Is the data link between the dock and the drone physical or wireless? Um, it is both. RealSense cameras continue to exist for now. Yes, um, we had a terrible scare a couple of uh, weeks ago, um, but it turns out that it's still fine. But we're, work we're working on um, in-house cameras, which um, will hopefully solve that problem. Um, how do you manage the latency 
from the vision sensors for state estimation. Um, and time slip. OK, so in terms of time, uh, we do time synchronization over Mavlink um, across uh, both systems. So all data coming from the uh, mission computer is time stamped, and then it gets translated to the time base of the autopilot. Um, in terms of latency, um, we do a bunch of things to try and manage that latency. Um, so for example, on the autopilot side, we use um, IMU forward uh, prediction to deal with some of the latency, um, which we incur from either vision processing or the entire uh, data transfer. Um, but it's it it's it's mostly it mostly comes down to very careful software design to uh, make sure we're always uh, meeting those latency budgets and we have some margin there. Um, are you looking for a replacement for Intel cameras? Yes. Um, we're working on something in-house. How did you fit all these algorithms, all that compute, onto a small companion computer? So um, I guess a large part of it is being really, really careful um, in our software engineering. Um, every piece of our... Um, Flight core, which is like the the very uh, critical pieces, um, such as the the vision pipeline, some of the motion planning stuff. All of that is very carefully optimized using, um, for example, SIMD um, intrinsics, uh, so we can run those um, really really fast. And it's just a ton of effort to fit it all in. Uh, it is not easy. That, that's one of the reasons it took us years to get to this point. Um, I would say that we had kind of the basic functionality sorted out probably, what, maybe two years ago. But it takes a lot of time to kind of productionize that and make sure that it works um, in every situation, every environment, all sorts of like external conditions like temperature. Um, so we needed to take into account all of that. What is the precise latency you target from a raw sensor data to a map update? So that depends. Um, we have about 30 milliseconds between camera frames. So that is when we can actually get new data into the map. Um, but we update our state estimate internally much faster. So um, the motion planner can run faster than that. It is all Intel, no NVIDIA. Yes, that is correct. That is correct. I think that's all the questions, unless I missed something. Mm. Oh, wait, no, never mind. I missed a bunch. I don't know how this platform reorders the questions. Okay. How do you handle a situation where no path is safe? Um, so yes, we have encountered this in the wild. Um, there's stuff coming from both directions. There's um, like forklifts and all sorts of interesting things. Um, in the case where there's no safe motion plan and we can't move, we just look for a flat spot to um, put the vehicle down. So we just land um, once we find a um, flat spot. Elaborate on the concerns you want to address while moving to new versions of PX4. Um, it's not so much concerns as it is being able to certify it for the safety critical things we use it for. Um, just because PX4 is such a crucial piece of our flight stack, um, we try not to push updates to it very frequently without qualifying the software through hundreds of hours of flight first. And that, and we're in the process of doing that for V1.12 right now. Do you use real sense depth or calculate it on the CPU? We use real sense depth, but we do some interesting things with it to um, deal with situations where uh, the stereo matching fails. Do you sell it yet? Yes, we sell it today. Um, we um, it depends. So. We don't sell the drone as an independent piece. We sell it as a service. 
So if you're interested in this for your facility or for automating some industrial indoor use case, um, I'm happy to talk. Send me an email, and, and we can chat. You started from the end. Then there were new questions. Yeah, I realized that way too late. <laughs> um, do I need to refresh this, or is that it? Let's see. I think that is the latest questions. OK, cool. Um, so that's all I have. Um, feel free to keep sending me questions. I'll, be, I'll hang out for a little bit um, afterwards. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions over email if, if you need to. Um, if you found any of this interesting and you'd like to work on problems like this, we are hiring. So please, again, send me an email, ask me questions. Um, I always love talking with people. Uh, I see a new question here. Do you use the PX for internal functionality for object avoidance, or did you write your own? Um, it is a combination. So our high-level motion planner does. Uh, it's completely written in-house. But we do use a tweaked version of the PX for uh, collision avoidance uh, feature, too. That is the safety guarantee PX4 provides in case the high-level motion planner goes haywire. But it is a modified version of the algorithm, which lets us kind of fly through tighter spaces. And also, it does it in 3D instead of just like a 2D slice. Have you considered releasing an SDK for your platform for customers to use in their own research? Um, we have not. And I don't think this is something we're planning to do right now, um, particularly because we're very, very focused on nailing a handful of use cases where we can provide real customer value. Um, I don't know if there is a huge market for the case where we release an SDK. Would the localization and pathfinding technology be licensable for use in other vehicles, or is the particular vehicle a critical part of the system? Um, I think with a lot of effort, it could be. But yes, since we're building a product, we hyper-optimize for like one platform. And that is one of the things which lets us kind of squeeze out the kind of performance we get right now. So um, we're not planning to make this technology licensable in the near term. Did you ever test your drone in an outdoor scenario like in a forest? No, we have not. We're very focused on indoors. But um, personally, um, on some of the vision-based systems I've worked on outside Corvus, um, flying through forest is indeed something I've tried before. And it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, any thoughts on using infrared cameras for vision other than RGB cameras in case of poor lighting conditions? Um, yes, but it also introduces a bunch of other problems like glare and stuff reflecting off uh, shrink wrap, all sorts of interesting uh, photometric issues there um, if you want to use external illumination. So it's not almost not worth it. How much did you borrow from Vince Mono? Um, not nothing at all, actually. Um, I think Vince Mono came out um, probably a few years after we started developing our um, vSlam solution. Um, but I would say that the ideas there are, are quite similar, that you're doing feature tracking, you're doing um, kind of a sliding window optimization over some fixed set of poses. Is the vSlam system you guys have available as a paper or open source? No, it is not.
Where are you located? We're currently located in Boston. Um, we are planning to make a move sometime soon, though. So if you're in Boston and you want to meet, this is the time. Okay, so if that's it, um, I think I will go and have a look at the other sessions. Um, thank you very, very much for attending. I really love giving this talk. I was really looking forward to it because I haven't really met a bunch of people in the community for a while, just with COVID and everything happening. So I was really looking forward to this talk. And thank you, everyone, for attending. I really, really enjoyed it. Okay, goodbye. Thanks, everyone.